Hello and welcome for a second time to Africa, the countryside of South Africa, just outside Johannesburg. For the second in our series with Credo Mutwa, the Zulu Sanusi, or shaman, as many people around the world would call him, the keeper of the history, the true history of Africa and the Zulu people, and the official storyteller, in other words, the carrier of the knowledge and the symbolic stories of the Zulu nation. He is, without any question in my mind whatsoever, the most remarkable, astonishing man it's been my honor to meet. And to share his incredible knowledge has been a time that I personally will never forget. In the first of these videos, we discussed with Credo uh, the story of the Chittahuli, the reptilian extraterrestrial race from another world that came to the earth in the far ancient world that brought advanced knowledge which built many of the according to conventional history unexplainable magnificent structures um, all across the world thousands and thousands of years old and also interbred with humanity creating hybrid crossbreed bloodlines these bloodlines as my own research uh, for books like The Biggest Secret and Credo's immense knowledge of the African history uh, which he's gathered in his nearly 80 years of traveling this vast and amazing continent which both correlate the same story remarkably that this Chittahuli, this reptilian race interbred with humanity and the bloodlines became the almost demigods the royal ruling lines of the ancient world particularly in the ancient Near and Middle East, which were the middlemen, if you like, between the extraterrestrial gods to which people were literally sacrificed and the people in general. And as the genealogical research is showing, these crossbreed bloodlines, the Nephilim, as the Old Testament of the Bible calls them, the result of the interbreeding between the sons of God as the Bible calls them, the sons of the gods in the true translation, and earth women, the marriage, the bringing together of the sons of God and the daughters of men. This Nephilim crossbreed race, as the genealogy has shown, came out of that area and into Europe to become the aristocracy and the royal families of Europe, and then through the British Empire became uh, the ruling bloodlines of most of the world, in fact, today, almost all of the world. Like the 42 presidents out of the hundreds of millions of people who have been Americans since the Declaration of Independence in 1776, 42 have become president. They're all related. What? And they go back to these ruling aristocratic families, which eventually go back to the crossbreed uh, inter-relationship, inter-course between the Chittahuli, the Anunnaki, as some accounts call them, and human beings. And it's the British Empire that we're going to talk about now in its relationship to taking over the planet in a way that today is now global. The British Empire um, became the British Empire because this network of bloodlines, which had become known as the Illuminati, centered itself in London at operational level, uh, particularly after the arrival from Holland of William of Orange, who became King of England in 1689. And from that time, um, he signed the charter that created the Bank of England and the banking system as we know it started to expand and emerge. But from that time, the British Empire and the other European empires came into being and they took the planet over. Now, one immensely important area that they completely controlled and raped was the fantastic continent of Africa. And to look at how Africa was taken over by this Illuminati, Chittahuli, reptilian crossbreeds, and uh, indeed the reptilian race itself is behind it all, is to see how the world has been taken over, the methods used, the way it was done, the manipulations. And what we're going to talk to uh, Credo about now, among many other things, is the way that the continent of Africa was hijacked by the Illuminati. 
and I asked him first to tell me the story of how this great continent was taken over. So, there are mysteries in this world, but we as thinking human beings must look into. And one of these mysteries is this. There is overwhelming evidence of the fact that before Africa was actually colonized, by the white people from Europe. It was first prepared by strange people for this colonization. When the first Portuguese ships started sailing around the Cape of Good Hope, Strange beings appeared amongst our people, strange human-like creatures, usually creatures of great height, abnormally tall human-like beings, some of them with only one foot, appeared amongst our people, and they started doing things there which, which made it easier for the colonialists to invade us and to conquer us. What were they like in terms of their color and skin, Greta? Say, we do not know, but there are those who described them as a very, very white, chalk white in appearance. <coughs> this went on for so often that it became traditional to our people to represent these beings with white chalk. You found masks amongst our, our mask makers which were smeared entirely in white chalk to represent these creatures. These creatures were usually about eight feet tall, very, very slender, and they used to wear robes made of the, the tanned hides of certain type of antelope, usually the, the intensely black sable antelope. What, what name did the uh, people give to them? We gave them the, 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 the name Izilo Zengub, the beasts of the terrible blanket. These creatures were dressed exactly like Christian monks with hoods and long robes. In fact, I will draw you a likeness of one of them as it is shown in a rock painting. Now, these creatures used to live in holes in the ground or in, in, in uh, 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 underground, uh, uh, in underground caverns or in, in, in gullies over which a roof of logs and, and vegetation as well as swords was placed. And it may be of interest to you, sir, that Portuguese explorers and Portuguese seamen used to see these one-legged creatures hopping about and sometimes disappearing into the ground as if by magic. And these creatures were called by the Portuguese sailors monopods. They wore a long robe that reached down to their ankles 
and they appeared as they moved through the bush as if they only had one leg. Monopods were seen in Africa and they were also seen in America before America was colonized by the white people. Among the Native Americans? Yes, sir. The, one of the <coughs> one of the things that amazed me is that the story of America and the story of Africa was the same. It is said sir, that these monopoles introduced certain knowledge to our people. They actually prepared our people mentally for what was to come. For example, these monopoles, these uh, beasts of the terrible blanket, used to wear a cross-like ornament on their chests as a charm, a cross made of either gold or silver. Doesn't it amaze you that when the Native Americans saw the cross painted on the, on the sails of Christopher Columbus's ships, they recognized it as a sacred object. Let me tell you, sir, exactly the same happened in South Africa, where our people were made familiar with the cross long before the white man set foot in Africa. And when our people saw this cross, this time brought by missionaries, they recognized it as a sacred object. In other ways, now, I don't know how to put this, but can you put it for me? Our people were prepared long beforehand to, to recognize certain Christian symbol and Judaic symbols and when they saw them in the hands of the colonists later they saw them for what they were. This is one of the reasons why Mr. Ag, Africans accepted and protected Christian missionaries even while fighting a life and death struggle against white colonialism. How is it that a man would accept the religion of an invader while at the same time fighting a life and death battle against the encroachments that this invader was making into his native land? This happened in America and this happened in Africa, and the, 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 the sources of this uh, 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 acceptance were the same. I, I wish I could put this in much better English than I'm, use, I'm using now, because I feel it is important. I, th I think you're, you're putting it um, very clearly that it seems that this Chittahuli um, were uh, going around the world preparing for the uh, occupation from the Illuminati Center in London and Europe of these various areas like Native America and Africa. Yes, sir. The, the story, you see, a great fraud is being committed in educational circles sir, in that the educationists in their ivory towers force our young people to look at the colonization of Africa and America as if they were two separate uh, in incidents. But certain factors in this colonization 
were the same in Africa and the same in America, and they achieved exactly the same results. This is why I always argue that the conspiracy, the international conspiracy, began long, long before colonial, colonial times in Africa and in the Americas. <coughs> and the results were the same. Look at this. Sir. Here is the great Zulu king, Shaka. Shaka is a warrior second to none. Shaka is also a prophet second to none. Shaka welcomes white people <coughs> to his empire of Nata. Shaka allows missionaries to operate freely through his country. And when Shaka dies, before Shaka died, he warned his half-brother, Dinga, that he must, under no circumstances, attack the white people, and that he must allow missionaries to operate freely amongst the Zulu people. In fact, during the reign of King Dinga and Shaka's half-brother, Two missionaries, Reverend Halstead and Reverend Owen, had a mission station within sight of King Dingan's great village. But wait, sir, let me point out one thing. These missionaries were converting our people to Christianity and they often went out of their way to criticize and undermine the king's authority in the eyes of their converts. In other words, we have an amazing phenomena here where a great king is being undermined by the very people he has allowed to preach freely in in his country. Why? Not a single South African scholar has ever asked himself why. Why why were our people so seemingly stupid as to allow a foreign religion into their country? Now, let me show you say, two horrendous tragedies. When the Belgians colonized the Congo, which is today the Democratic Republic of the Congo, King Leopold declared that the Congo was to be his personal property. And King Leopold and his men tortured and murdered several million black Congolese people in an act of genocide equal only to what the Nazis were later to do to the Jews. But under savage ill-treatment, under savage torture and humiliation, the Congolese, virtual slaves in their country, still respected Christian missionaries and followed them and gained hope from them. And in 1907, this time in the country today known as Namibia, the Germans embarked on a policy of genocide against the warrior people known as the Hereros. They murdered so many Hereros. They tortured and slaughtered so many men and women of that, of that nation, nation that for, until as recently as the 1940s, Herero women 
were still so traumatized by what had happened that they were not producing any young at all. But in spite of the hideous genocide committed by General Van Prother, in spite of the multiple murders, the Herero people clung to the Christian faith. Why? Exactly why? Our, I now come to my people, the Zulus. When King Dingan murdered the four trekker leader, Peter Tiff, the act was watched by Reverend Owen and Reverend Halstead from their mission station, which was built on a hill overlooking King Dingan's great uh, village. Halstead and Owen, unharmed by Dingan, decided to flee from the place after that. And Dingan was deeply sorrowed that his favorite creatures had decided to leave him. And King Taifuai, the warrior king who won the Battle of Isanzwane in 1875 or thereabouts, never harmed missionaries. And a king who followed Taifuai King Dinizu, who was brutally tortured by the English, had a great friend in Reverend, in Bishop Colenso, a Christian bishop, and his daughters, one of whom was called Mary. Although he had suffered so much at the hands of the British authorities, King Dinizulu never abandoned his white Christian friends. They comforted him and he depended desperately upon them and their Bible in his darkest hours. Would the same basic story, Prado, be true of how the British, um, or the Illuminati based in Britain, um, took over Australia to... Yes, I have found exactly the same story. The Aborigines, like Africans, were deliberately softened up long before they, they were colonized by the white people. There were men, mysterious men, who often posed as gods, who who undermined the will of the Aborigines to resist the encroachment of the colonialists. It's also interesting that Captain Cook, who is the guy who's supposed to have, quote, discovered um, Australia and New Zealand, that area of the world, yes. was actually sponsored and funded and in fact controlled by the Royal Society, which was a Freemasonic and is a Freemasonic a science operation based in London. Yes, sir. Let, let me show you another interesting thing. There is a man I have been investigating in vain for over 40 years now. A man who committed acts of hideous genocide upon our people here in South Africa. A man of whom historians are so fond that he is practically a white cow whom you may not dare to point a finger at. If you see me sitting in front of you, a man who was demo demonized in over 30 years ago by the South African news media, it was because I asked questions about this white man, Sir George Gray. Who was Sir George Gray? What was he? Was he a Freemason? Was he an Illuminati? How is it that this Sir George Gray, 
who is the, the actual founder of the most oppressive laws that British colonialism ever settled our people with. Apartheid was laid down by Sir George Gray. The carrying of identity papers was laid down by Sir George Gray in the, in the 1850s, in the last century. And Sir George Gray dealt our kings a mortal blow. But let me first tell you, this man was sent from London to quell a Maori rebellion in New Zealand which had defeated the efforts of military men. The Maori were unstoppable. Their rebellion was blazing like a bushfire through New Zealand. But when George Gray was sent to New Zealand, sir, he managed to quell this rebellion with a very, very little loss of life. What did George Gray do? I have never been able to find a book which tells me exactly what did George Gray do in New Zealand in order to pacify the Maoris who had beaten the efforts of the, sol the British soldiers. Because that same George Gray was brought from New Zealand to South Africa in order to quell a great rebellion by the Tosa people. And George Gray used outright trickery in order to force the Tosa people to actually destroy themselves. George Gray deliberately and cold-bloodedly tricked the Tosa people into slaughtering their own cattle, burning their own crops. It is one of the saddest stories of our country's blood-drenched history. And almost overnight, George Gray reduced the cause of people of the Eastern Cape into a nation of dying skeletal starvelings. Because after, after George Gray had manipulated the causes with the raw trickery into destroying their crops, destroying their cattle, he practically had them on the plate. Hunger, raw hunger and starvation, achieved what military might had failed to, to achieve after many, many embattled decades. George Gray was a psychologist par excellence. George Gray was a trickster who knew the native races and he knew how to exploit their beliefs to, their, to bring about their own destruction. Let me show you what Gray did. One day, when great tension was boiling up in the Cape, and when the, the colonialists were threatened by yet another border war between themselves and the, and the Kosa people, a number of women were, a number of Kosa women, amongst them a Sangoma, a priest, priestess diviner called Nongaus were tending crops when they heard voices calling out to them in the bush. Nongaus, because she was a spiritual person and a healer, responded to these voices. She went together with her sister Nondeto to investigate. And they found 
a deep hollow in the ground and from this hollow they heard the voices coming and as the women knelt next to the hollow the three amazing figures emerged from the grass tall men wearing long black robes made of animal skin with very big hoods on their heads appeared out of the hall and one of their faces were painted white or so it seemed to the terrified Tosa women and they were, these men were unusually tall and they told the, the woman no mouth, whom they distinguished by her attire as a traditional healer, that she must go to the Tosa people and tell them to start killing their cattle and start destroying their crops. Mr. Ike, I want to show you this book a book which was published many years ago, a book written by me and which made me one of the most hated black men in South Africa by the white establishment. In this book, I write amongst other things about a man called Sir George Gray. And uh, in this book, I questioned certain things about this man, because Sir George Gray was the creator of race discrimination and apartheid in South Africa. Apartheid was not really created by the Afrikaners. It was created by this man many, many years ago. Well, Sir George Gray was Illuminati, um, a black magician, and uh, fits the bill exactly with what happened in all these other countries you're talking about. Say, when I questioned, the, when I raised questions in this book about Sir George Gray, I was savagely attacked by nearly every professor in various universities of South Africa. The intellectual prostitutes, yes. Yes. The liars in ivory towers, as I call them. I asked, I said that the, the, the... Well, let's... Mushomi was getting old and he had received many wounds in, in battle, fighting to protect his people against invaders. One day, Mushomi was in his house when somebody knocked on the door frame of the house. And Mushomi asked the intruder to come in. And into the hut there came a frightening being, a being whose face was as white as the face of death, a being which wore a hood over its head, a being with unnaturally wide shoulders, a being who wore a long robe of sable antelope skin. This being squatted near the entrance of the, of the hut in which Mushomi was, and the being told Mushomi that he was to take one of his golden earrings, the earrings of kingship, and go on foot for a long distance to find 
a young man known as the Porco and to give him this earring. But what are you saying, great one? said Musomi, utterly terrified by this unearthly being. You are saying that I, Musomi, must go and find this boy and make him my successor? And the being said, yes, we, your forefathers, order you to do this. Musomi was thunderstruck. He tried to argue because Musomi had sons whom he was hoping would succeed him after death. Now, he was now being told to go and seek out a strange young man and make him future king of the Basutu people. And as Musomi tried to speak, the terrible tall being stood up in the hut and threw a handful of black powder on into the fireplace there was a terrible flash a burst of white smoke and as Musomi shielded his eyes the being left the heart on the following day Musomi told his people this in a council meeting and the people advised Musomi to obey. You are the king, Mshomi. You have been our king for a long time. You are blameless and you are as brave as a lion. But against the gods, what can you do? And thus it was that King Mshomi was given a tame ox by his people and he rode on the back of this ox accompanied by two of his best warriors and he went out to seek this strange boy whom he he had been ordered to make future king of the Basutu. he found the boy with his companions high up on the mountain. The boy was, was a bandit. He lived by stealing cattle from rich men. He was a typical black Robin Hood. And Musomi greeted this boy, the porco, and he pinned his golden earring to the Pogo's right ear and said, I am commanded by the spirits of my forefathers to appoint you, the Pogo, future king of the Basutu people. I am told that you are going to make this nation great. I am told that you are going to protect it. I, Mustomi, the armed one, have spoken. Mustomi left the port, and Mustomi sickened and died some time later. And the man named the port, a young man, a cattle stealing bandit. became known as King Mushweshwe, the first of the Basutu people. As the so-called God had spoken, it so did happen. Mushweshwe 
who had now discarded the name of Dipolo, which means disappointment, and assumed the name Mushueshwe, which means the barber or the beard shaver. Mushueshwe himself started seeing vision. And he started obeying the instructions of these visions that he should build a great nation out of the Basutu nation. He collected together all the fugitives who had fled from the wars in the Cape. He collected together all the refugees who had fled from the wars by Shaka in Nata, and he molded them into the nation known as the Basutu nation, which today inhabits the land called Lesotho. But wait, there is more to the story of Mushweshwe. Mushweshwe was under attack by the, the, the Africaners. And one day, he received another vision, a vision that told him that if his people were to be saved, he had to place himself and his people under the protection of Queen Victoria. And he did just that. When I was a child, when I was a young scholar, the land today known as Lesotho was known as the Basotho Land Protectorate. Here was a king actually destroying his sovereignty as a ruler. Mushweshwe enjoyed the loyalty of his people. Mushweshwe was greatly loved by the nation that he had formed. Mushweshwe had not really needed to make himself the subordinate of the British Empire, but he did on advice of visions that he had. Right, David, you can see how it was done. <laughs> but there is more, Mr. David Ed. Say, I think these men were secretly manipulated. I think these men had their fears and secret beliefs played against them. It is the easiest thing, say, to manipulate a man who, is, who rules a country and who suddenly feels himself unsecure. For example, the British appear to have pursued a double-edged strategy in South Africa. They did it in Natal, they did it in Lesotho, and they did it in Swaziland and in Botswana. What did they do? They used to they used to manipulate the white African Africana settlers, the Boers, into fighting the native people. And then they used to send agents to the embattled black kings to tell these black kings that the best thing that they could do is to place their people and themselves under the protection of the British Empire. Problem, reaction, solution. Yes, sir. Now, 
Let me ask you, sir. How did a black king know that the English were the most militarily powerful people at that time? The Africans only saw their immediate enemy, the Afrikaners. The, uh, the black people only saw the, the boards traveling in their ox wagons. They only saw the, 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 the muskets of the boards. But here we have a situation where a black king learns from someone about the powerful ships, seagoing ships, and the huge guns that the British have got and this king is then advised to place himself and his people under the protection of the British. It was a strategy that the British pursued in different forms deep into Africa. They often won huge swaths of mineral-rich territory without even firing a shot. They had gun runners who smuggled bundles of muskets, tower muskets, and even Snyder rifles to black tribes. And wars between the Afrikaners and the blacks came into being in Lesotho. One of the reasons that forced Mushuashe to to make Lesotho a protectorate under Great Britain was because he feared uh, he feared the repeated attacks which the angry Boers were launching against him because some of his people were attacking the Boer farmers and stealing their cattle. Can we talk about um, people like David Livingstone and those that charted the interior of Africa, etc. Because it seems, Fredo, without question, we're looking at an unbroken string here with one element of the takeover following another. So surely the, uh, those, um, quote, heroes of Britain that charted the interior of Africa must have been involved in the story. They were. They were. In fact, I can say to you now, sir, that the man in whose home Livingstone stayed, namely Reverend Moffat, was the one man who was grinding down King Kama's mind. He was the one man who used to send books and newspapers to Kama. They were living in the land of the Batwana, and they lived alone, a missionary and his wife. M Reverend Moffat had a, a family of children at Kuruman in, in, the, in the Northern Cape. And Reverend Moffat received Livingstone Reverend Moffat, because he was viewed by the Botswana as a man of God, could do what he liked in the land of the Botswana. He carved himself a huge stretch of land. He planted any vegetables or fruits there that he chose. Early in his arrival, he found that area teeming with buffaloes, which is why it is called Kuruma. It's really a corruption of the Batwana word Udumane, the gathering place of the buffalo. Moffat used to welcome explorers and hunters, many of whom traveled alone through South Africa. And these hunters and adventurers 
people like Ken, Reverend Campbell and others were going through South Africa, exploring it. Some of them wrote books about the local customs and the local tribes that they encountered. And I think these explorers were much more than what they seem to be. So how is Christianity used? We talked uh, uh, about the fact that the uh, beasts of the terrible blanket, the strange people that appeared before the Europeans, um, had introduced all the symbols and what have you that prepared people for Christianity in um, Africa. How was it used once the Christianity uh, people, the, uh, the Christian religion, arrived? I will tell you, sir, from what I saw as a young child. The Christian religion, or rather the missionaries that brought it, behaved like dictators. They ill-treated our people. They humiliated them and they stole huge tracts of land from our people using the name of Jesus Christ. I want to give you this historical fact. Sir. If you go to Natal near Der and you come to a place called Mary and Hill near Derbe, you will find one of the biggest and one of the oldest mission schools in South Africa. Marion Hill sits on huge tracts of land. These tracts of land were stolen from the Zulu people by a missionary called Chimlet. And even to this day, the people of Marion Hill can tell you that that man was not just a missionary. He was also a crook and a pitiless exploiter of the black people. He was a monk, but he was much more than a monk. It was said that this chimlet worshipped not God, not the Virgin Mary, but Satan himself. So that takes up a glass. Uh, from the way the Illuminati were. And the uh, other thing that must have happened, um, fundamental in so many ways, is that the original knowledge, the knowledge that you carry and people like you carry, uh, must have been destroyed, pushed underground, and um, basically the true story of history lost. Yes, sir. Let me tell you what the missionaries did. The missionaries used to employ the tactic of preaching the so-called gospel to our people. And at the same time, they used, to, they used to manipulate our people into partying with some of their holiest relics. Please, uh, there is in London a place that I saw near the London docks in an obscure street. It is a heavily guarded warehouse which belongs to the British Museum of Humankind. We were allowed to visit this place when I was in London in 1970, in, in, 19, in 1997. And there, in the British, in that warehouse, I saw cupboard after cupboard after cupboard filled with priceless African artifacts in ivory, in bronze, in various indigenous woods, and sometimes in iron and in gold. I saw royal bangles from dead kings, bangles made of brass and bronze, bangles which showed every sign 
that they had been removed by force from the arms of dead men and dead women. All these things, I was told, had been collected by Theophilus Shepstone and the London Missionary Society and were sent to this museum where no African is allowed to view them. I was lucky because I was accompanied by a white woman whose father, I suspect, was a Freemason. Now, let me tell you, sir, what the missionaries did also. The missionaries established hospitals in their mission station. Reverend Moffat had a hospital in that mission station. And when an African was brought there, sick unto death, the missionary used to tell this African that as a condition to his entering the hospital, he first had to be baptized as a Christian. And also as another condition, for entering the hospital and receiving missionary treatment, the sick African had to surrender all artifacts from his ancestors that he had in his possession. Yeah. One day, say, my grandfather, Zingo, had an accident. He had bought himself an ox wagon but he did not know how to control it. And one day the ox wagon plunged off a cliff and my grandfather was badly injured. And when he was taken to a mission hospital in the west of Zululand, the first thing that the missionary said to my grandfather was this, that he knew the missionary, that my grandfather owned a heap of metal objects which he kept in, his, in one of his huts, and that as a condition for receiving treatment for his broken bones, he had to surrender all that metal property to the missionary. Those things you have got in your home are full of evil spirits, said the missionary reverently. You must let me have them so that I can take them to a holy place in England where they would be destroyed. My grandfather stood up shakily and walked out of the mission hospital. He walked and somewhere along the, the road he collapsed. And tribes people who knew him took him to their village and there when a passing Africana doctor rode by in his ox wagon, the black people asked this doctor, who was not a missionary, to please take care of my grandfather. The doctor took my grandfather aboard his ox wagon and took him to his farm far away. And there, the Africana doctor, a herbalist really, as he was called, a Hermes Yeren, he treated my grandfather free of charge, and he didn't place any conditions for his treatment. And my grandfather 
out of gratitude, returned to his village, a healthy man, and took three fat cows and led them with his sons to the faraway home of the Africana bird. Again and again, our people were robbed of their heritage. Our people were robbed of scientific equipment. Our people were robbed of irreplaceable artifacts, some of them dating back hundreds of years into the past, by the missionaries, especially the London Missionary Society. And if you go into that museum, say, uh, near the near the the docks in London, you will find what I saw, and it will make you weep. What's your own experience uh, in your life, Fredo, of uh, the use of Christianity in Africa to divide, rule, and suppress the people? Now, let me tell you. When missionaries came to South Africa. They deliberately created a huge wave of enmity between those blacks that they converted and those blacks who resisted Christian conversion. They, they created such a divide that they actually broke up huge families. And it even it got worse when Catholics, Anglicans, Methodists, and Presbyterians spread through South Africa. There was developed deliberately in Africans of different religious de de denominations the same enmity that exists now between the Catholics and the Protestants in England. Black Protestants were forbidden from talking to black Catholics. Black Wesleyans did not even ask the time of day from black Presbyterians. It was such a total chaos and the only beneficiaries were the missionaries themselves. But let me tell you more what used to be done. Missionaries used to forbid any converted Christian black from having anything whatsoever to do with an unconverted black. Love relationships between so-called heathen blacks and Catholic blacks were forbidden by the missionaries. That was how my father and my mother parted, traumatizing my life even before I was born. My father was, had been a confessing Catholic and he fell in love with what was called a heathen Zulu woman. Now the condition for such a love was that the woman had to submit herself into the Christian faith. And my grandfather, a fierce old warrior, contemptuously refused to have my mother become a Christian convert. I used to kill white men at Isandwa, and I am not going to allow a daughter of mine to follow the religion of spear food. And say, if in a mission st station a, a church-going black 
state court to exceed the neglect, the church going black was brutally punished by the missionaries. And he was punished in a way which to Africans was horrible. Inside the mission church, there were the pews, the benches on which the, the congregation sat. But next to the door, just as you entered the door of the church, there were special benches for those Christian blacks who had broken the law. And so, if it was found by the white missionary or the black missionary that a certain person had had anything to do with a heathen, that person was punished in a very terrible way. He or she was made to sit next to the door so of the church inside so that all who entered the church would look would look at this one and know that here is the lawbreaker who had broken the laws of Jesus Christ. Were you um, uh, pushed into the Christian religion to start with quite a before the penny drop was made? Yes sir I was. You see after my mother and my father had separated, my mother gave birth to me. And for a long time, I suffered as a child because I was born illegitimate. I was called a bastard. I had no right as a human being. The law of the Zulus at that time was very, very strict regarding illegitimate children. My mother suffered. She was often beaten up by other girls in the village. And I suffered too. Other children were forbidden from playing with me. And I headed cattle in the bush alone. And there, many strange things happened to me which do not concern us here, however. And when I was seven years old, there came to my grandfather's village a brother of my father. And he asked to take me away from there. And my grandfather said, Nothing could please me more than that this little bastard should be removed from my home. He is a disgrace to my family. And so I was taken by my father's brother to the south of Natal, where I was baptized as a Catholic. And the ridiculous name, Cred, was placed upon my head. A name I hate very much, even to this day. I grew up, say, as a Catholic. And we were all Catholics in our home, as most people in Natal are. And then one day, after we had left Natal, my father left the Catholic Church and adopted one of the worst branches of the Christian religion that you can find. My father started following the teachings of an American woman called Mary Baker Eddy. She, who was the leader of the Christian Science Church, under the laws of the Christian Science Church, you are not allowed to take medicine under any circumstances, no matter how seriously ill you are. And for years we suffered 
my half-sisters and my half-brothers and I. We sickened and we were not allowed to take any medicament. We had suffered before under the Catholic Church, having to confess sins every weekend to a priest we could barely see. Sometimes it was so ridiculous that we, we often created sins against ourselves we had not committed in order to please the Catholic Father. And now we were suffering under the teachings of Mary Baker Eddy, teachings which I, I now see in my adult life as having been the very essence of the purest rubbish. Then, after a great sickness in 1937, I was taken, during my, that great sickness, I was taken back to Zululand by my father's brother, Anton. And there, I was healed by a man I had been conditioned to be looked upon as a stupid heathen, namely my grandfather, my, my father, my, the father of my mother. After that, sir, I began to see how great the knowledge that the black people possessed was. I began to see that the missionaries were actually deceiving us, that they were teaching us lies at school about our people. And then one day I got into serious trouble. I was now a budding artist, painting pictures for the mission school. And I made the mistake of portraying the Virgin Mary as a Zulu woman based upon my mother's faith. And I portrayed Jesus Christ as a Zulu boy. And for that, I was caned and expelled from school. The reason I was not caned by, by the white missionary only, I was caned also by the black teachers who accused me of having insulted Jesus Christ by painting him as a black. So you can see the, the stark mental confusion into which our people had been blind. Men caning a boy because he had painted Christ as a black man and saying that by blackening Christ's face, this boy had, had blasphemed. This makes us think, Credo, how easy it is for the few to control the world when most of the world gives its mind away. Yes, sir, but one must understand, Mr. Dojita, that we human beings are weak creatures. We fall a victim to ill health. We fall a victim to sometimes nameless fear. And that is where the forces of darkness pounce upon us when we are afraid, sick, or insecure. Many black people who were converted easily to Christianity were people who had been traumatized by war. You see, during the great Zulu wars in Natal, thousands of black men and women used to run away from Zululand to Deben, where huge refugee camps, bigger than anything we have ever seen in Africa, soon blossomed. These refugee camps were fertile ground 
for Christian missionary operation. These refugee camps were places where many a self-seeking missionary was sure of walking away with several hundred converts. Fredo, um, all these methods we've been talking about here um, uh, can be uh, connected to this one stream unbroken under different names that came out of London. The next major stream I'd like to look at was that represented by Cecil Rhodes in the British South Africa Company, which, um, from what I've seen, transformed perhaps more than anything the uh, structure, the economy, and the life of South Africa. W what about him and that camp? <laughs> Many, many stories are told about Cecil Rhodes. Many, many, many stories. And one day I shall amuse you with the one. Cecil Rhodes was a strange man. Like all great men, he was a weird mixture of great viciousness and mercy. Cecil Rhodes was a tricker after knowledge and he used to do many things for those blacks who gave him the knowledge he sought. First, Cecil Rhodes was interested in legends that he had read about Africa and the Africans. He wanted to know where our people used to mine minerals. And his men used to go from village to tribal village, carrying cheap blankets, traveling shawls, and stats and hats to bribe tribes people into showing them where mines were ancient African mines way. In fact, I can tell you, sir, that many of the mineral deposits that are in South Africa, from the diamonds of Kimberley in the Cape to the coal fields of Natal, to the gold mines of, of the Witwaters Rand and of the land now known as Zimbabwe, all of these mineral deposits were pointed out to Rhodes and his men by Africans. Africans willing to do anything to impress this strange white man. Cecil Rhodes smiled very often. especially before he ordered the slaughter of an entire tribe. Cecil Rhodes got to know how deeply our people respected a powerful man who reconciled two clashing factions. And one amazing thing, sir, when confronted by black people who were asking him pointed questions, Cecil Rhodes used to deny that he was the leader of the white people, for example, in Rhodesia. He acted like a third party, a man who was dedicated to reconciling black and white and stopping conflict between them. And until he died, say, Cecil Rhodes was known by the, the Maldebele people as Mlamlangunzi, the brave one who parts two clashing bulls. 
At one time, Susan Rhodes went to a very holy place. And a group of hills called Ndaba Zenduna. And there, under a tree whose remains can still be seen, Cecil Rhodes sat with a group of Makebele elders and actually persuaded them to stop warlike actions against the British Empire. How did he manipulate uh, the black tribes of Africa so that he got all these mineral rights which have now become consolidated gold fields and De Beers and Anglo-American? Cecil Rhodes uh, used to walk about completely unafraid amongst the Makebele people and he used to tell them to attack the Mashona people whom he called dogs. And in this way, Cecil Rhodes caused the caused the wars between blacks, which he then stepped in as an intercessor. Cecil Rhodes built up a formidable hatred between the Makebenes and the Mashona. He played the Matebenes off against the Mashonas and the same the other way around. What is strange about Susan Rhodes was that, and which is never revealed in the many books that were told about him, was that Susan Rhodes was a student in search of the deepest mysteries of Africa. He made friends with healers, with shamans, and he actually took part in their rituals. And through them, he learned of the many secret and holy places which were to be found in the land that now bore his name, Rhodesia. And one of these holy places that he learned about was those hills upon whose summit you see great boulders, namely the Matobo Mountains, the mountains of the great boulders. There, Rhodes learned that the most powerful kings of the Mashona and the Makaranga people lay buried. And he decreed that after death, he too should be buried there. But isn't that um, very much linked uh, to legends and stories of the Chittahuli and the reptilian? Yes, sir. The Matopo Mountains are held even today as one of the places on earth where the Chitauli are often seen and where they land in their crafts. And there is more, sir, regarding this thing. Much more. Cecil Rhodes had himself buried above the grave of a much older leader and a far greater man than himself. We are told, sir, that the, the first Monomotapa, a remote ancestor of mine, Nyatsimbi Mutota, died and was buried in the Matopo Mountains. And Cecil Rhodes found the place where Nyatsimbi lies buried. And he ordered that he should be buried on higher ground than Nyatsimbi. And by, by so doing, 
he showed the Makebele and the Mashona people in death that he, John Rhodes, was far superior to Nyatsimbi Mutok. How did Rhodes' influence in the creation of the mines and the whole basis of the, what even now the modern South African economy, how did that affect the people in terms of control and losing control of their destiny? First of all, sir, our people totally ignored the large mining operations that they soon saw taking place in their country. Our people were happy to stay in their villages, but new laws were instituted by the colonial government of Natal especially, where all able-bodied men were forced to go on a long distance journey by foot to work for starvation wages in the diamond fields of Kimberley. Many, many stories are told of brave black men and women who went to Kimberley to work in the city of, in the town of Kimberley, amongst all kinds of disease and corruption and violence, and also to work in the great hole of Kimberley, a hole which before had been the site of one of the holiest hills known to our people in that part of South Africa. Cecil Rhodes and his people did much to destabilize black family life in, our, in Natal and other places inhabited by black people. He forced the local chiefs to to pay tax, they and their followers. He forced the chiefs to send their sons and the sons of their people to work in the diamond fields. He told them that if they refused to do this, he would call the soldiers from England to destroy them all. Tax was now demanded of our people, not in cattle, as had been the case before, but in gold sovereigns. So a young man had to go, leave his father's home, and go by foot over the Drakensberg Mountains walk great distances to Kimberley and there to work for one gold sovereign a year, a sovereign which would then be turned over to the chief who would in his turn turn it over to the colonial authorities as tax. The South Africa Company, the British South Africa Company of Cecil Rhodes, um, created so much of the economy of South Africa that we see today. Um, and this has been taken over by other companies, not least the ones controlled by the Oppenheimer family, who seem to be to, be the, uh, to me to be the Illuminati's branch managers in uh, South Africa. Um, they uh, are involved in the Anglo-American Corporation, in uh, De Beers, the diamond operation. Then there's another offshoot of the Rhodes network, which is the Lawn Row Company, uh, London Rhodesia Company, which to me has grotesquely uh, manipulated and abused Africa um, since its creation. What's your view of this post-Rhodes network that so controls South Africa today? Sir, in answering your question, I want to be very, very fair, because my philosophy as an African warrior priest commands me to be fair even to my deadliest enemies. 
the Anglo-American Corporation has done a lot of good in South Africa during the course of its existence. Sir Ernest Oppenheimer assisted in the building of several townships near Johannesburg. He did not do it for love, of course. He did not do it for altruistic reasons. But the fact was that on a massive scale, he and his company created roofs over the heads of many black families. In fact, a large part of Soweto near Johannesburg is his company's creation. But the Anglo-American Corporation also has a lot to answer for in front of the throne of God. This corporation has caused the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, of black men in its mines. Now let me tell you, sir, a very, very heart-rending thing. I have evidence that can stand in any court that organizations such as the Anglo-American Corporation often overthrow African governments by what I call remote control. Not so long ago, a great friend of mine, Dr. Hastings Kamuzubanda, was overthrown in Malawi. He was overthrown by mobs going on the rampage in nearly every city in his country. Before the overthrow of Dr. Banda, the Anglo-American Corporation and other gold mining corporations in South Africa had barred hundreds of Malawian miners from coming to seek a living in South Africa in the only way they know how, namely by mining. Why? Because it was believed that many Malawian gold miners suffer from AIDS. And when Dr. Banda's government was overthrown, amongst the thousands of people who stormed into the streets of Blantyre and other cities were enraged men who had been refused the right to come to South Africa to earn a living there. Again and again, I have seen this happen. Before the, the, the tragedy in Lesotho, mine workers were retrenched from the gold mines. And many of these mine workers were Basutus. They went to Lesotho, and there, when the country collapsed, after the rigged elections of about a year ago, mine workers took to the streets and created the violence that brought about the demise of the Basutu nation, which we see today. What about Lonro and uh, its influence in Tiny Roland, its late um, and infamous head? Is he dead? Yeah. Roland? Mm -hmm. Well, 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 well. I wonder what he's going to say to Ngulungulu, the great God, when he comes to the land of the ancestors. You know, sir, it's very strange that men like Roland 
are just as perishable as we all are. Roland was a genocide. He and his corporation were behind many of the bloodiest wars and coups d'etat in Africa. Wherever there was war, wherever there was the smuggling of heavy armaments, such as tanks and, and, and artillery pieces, there you had the name Londra. Tiny Roland was a man whom I had heard about during the war, a man who openly sympathized with the Nazis. Tiny Roland was a man who was directly behind the seizure of the country Rhodesia by Mr. Ian Smith, so-called UDI. He either facilitated it or he was directly responsible for it. Tiny Roland was one white man whom thousands of black people hated throughout Southern Africa. Our people called him Wena or Ingwenya, which means the chewing crocodile. One reason why Roland was so bitterly hated was because not far from the Victoria Falls, there is a small town called Wanki. That town was once a very, very sacred place to the Makaranga peoples. Wanki stands in, a, in what was once a huge forest which was once sacred to the great earth mother in ancient times. Tiny Roland's men so heavily polluted that place in their mining operations that today it is a ravaged ghost of its former self. Isn't it the case, Credo, um, that these various names like Oppenheimer, uh, like Rhodes, like Roland, are actually uh, puppets of a, a force we call the Illuminati? And is it your view from your experience that the Illuminati and the uh, Jitahuli, the reptilians, are actually the same thing, and that actually through various forms it is the reptilian uh, force that has been behind this whole story you've been articulating? I think so, sir. In fact, I'm positive, sir. But what I cannot understand is why do rational, highly educated human beings allow themselves to become the instrument of the destruction of the only home that we have, we human beings, namely the earth upon which we live. Please, are you going to tell me that men like Mr. Oppenheimer and all those who work under him don't have what are called environment impact studies which give them a long-term view of what the ultimate results of their massive uh, mining operations will be. Of course, uh, they will have that done, but as we've discussed in um, another video, um, maybe destroying the environment is part of the agenda in terms of changing the, the planet from one which suits humans to one which suits the people that have been controlling you. Yes, sir. But this seems to be a terrible war 
that we see in front of us. A war which is taking place relentlessly, cold-bloodedly, and whose effects upon all our lives and upon the planet is, are becoming more evident as we go into the millennium. When you follow these uh, bloodlines, which have become the Illuminati, the reptilian bloodlines through history to the present day, um, you can see very clearly that human sacrifice, uh, blood rituals and so on, have followed them all the way. I mean, the, the, the bloodline, for some reason, are seriously into this stuff. Um, is that been your experience in terms of the secret societies and the uh, reptilian bloodlines that you've experienced? I say, other than necrophagy, where a human corpse or part of a human corpse is eaten, I have never seen an actual human sacrifice. But I have taken part in rituals where part of a dead body is consumed a dead body dug up from a grave. I must admit that. But in, in England say, and in America, I saw Freemasons indulging in some of their deepest rituals. And in both cases, the people concerned were not aware of the fact that they were being observed. At one time in Johannesburg, I viewed a Freemason ritual through a pair of binoculars. They were performing this ritual in a brightly lit room, and we watched nearly every detail of what they were doing. In England, I saw again the same thing close up. And again, the people concerned were not aware of my presence or the presence of the friend who had brought me to see what was happening. You know, sir, before I go deep into in answering your question, can I ask you, sir, are you a religious man? No. Good. Then another question, sir. Please. It is African courtesy that I should ask questions just as you ask me questions. Please, sir, exactly why do human beings or the Chitawuli perform human sacrifice. What, what is the reason behind this ghastly practice? Well, um, first of all, from people I've spoken to who've uh, taken part in these rituals, they tell me there's something in the blood which they want to consume because for some reason they need it and it, it appears they, they want blonde-haired, blue-eyed people for that more than any other. And the other thing, I guess, is that if you can perform a very malevolent, terrifying ritual um, in a particular vortex point, then they're going to um, affect the, the energy field very powerfully. And another reason which we've talked about is that at the point of sacrifice, this evil eye, this um, hypnotic stare, which these Chittahuli crossbreeds and, and uh, the Chittahuli themselves seem to have, can suck a person's um, energy consciousness out of their body. Yes, sir. But are you aware, Mr. David Ike, that people performing human sacrifice perform it for very, very serious and in a strange way, diabolically logical reasons mm -hmm. and very, very selfish ones? Go ahead. Say, there is something about human sacrifice 
which I beg to present to you. I am an initiate of over seven great initiations, and I have learned many things which would shock a saint. And one of these uh, is this. The basic reason behind human sacrifice is immortality, or rather longevity. When a great person feels that he or she is about to die, that great person does this. He or she orders the kidnapping of a particularly beautiful young person, usually a woman, a young girl, a virgin. But this virgin must have certain spiritual characteristics. And these characteristics must be certain qualities of the mind. In short, the victim must be psychic. The victim must be very beautiful. And the first thing that is done with the victims, she is not killed outright. She is, how you say it? She is, oh God, how can one say it? She is stripped naked and she is bound hand and foot. And then you, the one about to sacrifice her, lie naked in the same bed with her. But you do not have sex with her. Because if you do, the energy that you are building up for yourself will dissipate. You must lie with the victim, usually she is blindfolded, and you must embrace her and hold her and make and try to, to symbolically swallow her. To, to, to try to draw from her the most important essence of herself. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have the proper English to say this. I, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Sir? Yeah, absolutely. You must, your body must be moistened with fragrant oil and so the body of the victim to be. And you must embrace this victim for a number of days. You try and make a vibrational connection with them, is that what you're yes, trying to do? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In fact, I can tell you, kings and inyangas and sangomas who lived well beyond their hundredth year by simply taking a young virgin person, whether male or female, and lying with him or her, in a ritual bed without any sexual penetration whatsoever. This is the key to true immortality. Sir. This, I am telling you now, something which I am not allowed to tell anyone who is not an initiate and a Sanit. But I want to tell you that there is much more to human sacrifice than you think. First, the life force of the victim has got to be drunk. Then, after the victim has been in your bed for a number of days or weeks or months, then she must be told that she's going to die. And she must be encouraged to try to escape and she must be made to run, 
run in a direction where you know there are people who will recapture her. When she is recaptured, she will have a particular smell on her which will which is like that of an animal. You know, you know, Mr. David, this may shock you as a white person, but I want to tell you this that human sacrifice is much more than just cutting the throat of a victim. A lot a long procedure is followed before. You drink the energy of this young person. A, 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 a virgin girl radiates a severe heat which is sometimes used by my people to save the life of a man or a woman who has been caught in, in, on a cold mountainside. You know, in Zululens, snow sometimes falls on the Udundi mountains and other mountains. And sometimes you find that a man of importance has been caught in the terrible cold and he is close to freezing to death. And the quickest way to save this man is to place him and a virgin girl on the same bed. The heat of the girl and the life force of the girl will actually bring this man back to life. Now, in human sacrifice, all over Africa and all over Europe, I know, the life force of the victim-to-be is first absorbed in various ways. And one way, say, of absorbing the life force of a human, a, a, a girl, is to keep, to, to frighten her very much and then to take her intimate garment, such as her loincloth or, 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 or painting, and to smell it. Through that, you absorb some of the life force of the girl. And then, she must be frightened until great fear builds up inside her. She must be made to know that she is going to die. And under very ritual conditions, the person is killed. But she is killed slowly, and her screaming is forbidden. She must be scream. A tight piece of wax is often jammed into between the victim's jaws, a, a, a piece which she cannot swallow, and then she is killed. But wait. There is more, much, much more to this piece we are doing. The victim must bless you with her eyes as she dies. Sometimes the victim must be made to talk before she dies, which is why I was so horrified when I learned from various newspapers that after her terrible accident, Princess Diana had talked. That is how a human sacrifice victim is expected to do. She must talk. There is some kind of power that she releases by talking, which again benefits those whose victim she is. I'm convinced that she was ritually sacrificed. Yes, sir. And the, here is another thing. When the victim, 
the more beautiful a victim is, the more you are supposed to stare at her, all of you. And when the victim dies, when she, she struggles in her last pain, all of you involved there, no matter how old you may be, ejaculate, males or females, ejaculate, you must, otherwise the magic will not work. So this is why you get, um, uh, the, the, one of the reasons you get sexual activity so much involved in some of these rituals. Aha, uh -huh, yes. It is because as the victim dies, you feel such a great pity for her, such a love. She's a beautiful vessel being broken. And you feel the forces of rejuvenation coursing through your veins. You know, sir, this could be the reason why people who indulge in this form of ritual actually live for so long. But what is horrible is that the victim does not have to die in order to help her captor to extend his earthly life. Simply by lying in bed with the victim unmolested, month after month, actually rejuvenates the, pe the, the person in power. What I'm saying to you, sir, is something that was practiced all over Africa by some of our greatest kings. The captive girls were not killed. And I wish to point out another thing, sir. May I? Mm -hmm. The people of Israel practiced this strange custom. And King Constantine the Great, the Roman Emperor, who lived for well over 80 years, used to practice this custom of sleeping side by side with young virgins whom he did not, however, mate with. He was one of the creators of Christianity, right? Uh -huh. Now, let me tell you, sir, there is a name for this thing. In fact, the name is also in the Bible. It is called Shulamitism. In the Song of Songs of Solomon, the male singer repeatedly refers to the woman as his Shulamit. And a Shulamit is a woman who is brought especially to rejuvenate a dying person of importance. Quote the Bible. And a woman was brought unto him, and she lay with him, but yourself will dissipate. You must lie with the victim, usually she is blindfolded, and you must embrace her and hold her and make and try to to symbolically swallow her, to, to, to try to draw from her the most important essence of herself. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have the proper English to say this. I, do you understand what I'm trying to say, sir? Yeah, absolutely. You must, your body must be moistened with fragrant oil and so the body of the victim to be. And you must embrace this victim for a number of days. You try to make a vibrational connection with them, is that what you're yes, trying to do? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In fact, I can tell you, kings and inyangas and sangomas who lived well beyond their 100th 
hundredth year by simply taking a young virgin person, whether male or female, and lying with him or her in a ritual bed without any sexual penetration whatsoever. This is the key to true immortality, sir. This, I am telling you now, something which I am not allowed to tell anyone who is not an initiate and a Swamisi. But I want to tell you that there is much more to human sacrifice than you think. First, the life force of the victim has got to be drunk. Then, after the victim has been in your bed for a number of days or weeks or months, then she must be told that she's going to die. And she must be encouraged to try to escape. And she must be made to run. Run in a direction where you know there are people who will recapture her. When she is recaptured, she will have a particular smell on her which will which is like that of an animal. You know, you know, Mr. David, this may shock you as a white person, but I want to tell you this fact. <laughs> Human sacrifice is much more than just cutting the throat of a victim. A, lot, a long procedure is followed before. You drink the energy of this young person. A, 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 a virgin girl radiates a severe heat which is sometimes used by my people to save the life of a man or a woman who has been caught in, in, on a cold mountainside. You know, in Zululens, snow sometimes falls on the Udundi mountains and other mountains. And sometimes you find that a man of importance has been caught in the terrible cold and he is close to freezing to death. And the quickest way to save this man is to place him and a virgin girl on the same bed. The heat of the girl and the life force of the girl will actually bring this man back to life. Now, in human sacrifice, all over Africa and all over Europe, I know, the life force of the victim-to-be is first absorbed in various ways. And one way, say, of absorbing the life force of a human, a, a, a girl, is to keep, to, to frighten her very much and then to take her intimate garment, such as her loincloth or, 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 or candy, and to smell it. Through that, you absorb some of the life force of the girl. And then, she must be frightened until great fear builds up inside her. She must be made to know that she is going to die. And under very ritual conditions, the person is killed. But she is killed slowly, and her screaming is forbidden. She mustn't scream. A tight piece of wax is often jammed into between the victim's jaws, a, a, a piece which she cannot swallow, and then she is killed. 
but wait there is more much much more to this bizarre thing the victim must bless you with her eyes as she dies sometimes the victim must be made to talk before she dies which is why i was so horrified when I learned from various newspapers that after her terrible accident, Princess Diana had talked. That is how a human sacrifice victim is expected to do. She must talk. There is some kind of power that she releases by talking, which again benefits those whose victim she is. I'm convinced that she was ritually sacrificed. Yes, sir. And the, here is another thing, sir. When the victim, the more beautiful a victim is, the more you are supposed to stare at her, all of you. And when the victim dies, when she, she struggles in her last pain, all of you involved there, no matter how old you may be, ejaculate, males or females, ejaculate, you must, otherwise the magic will not work. So this is why you get, um, uh, the, the, one of the reasons you get sexual activity so much involved in some of these rituals. Aha, uh -huh, yes. It is because as the victim dies, you feel such a great pity for her, such a love. She's a beautiful vessel being broken. And you feel the forces of rejuvenation causing through your veins. You know, sir, this could be the reason why people who indulge in this form of ritual actually live for so long. But what is horrible is that the victim does not have to die in order to help her captor to extend his earthly life. Simply by lying in bed with the victim unmolested month after month actually rejuvenates the, pe the, the person in power. What I'm saying to you, sir, is something that was practiced all over Africa by some of our greatest kings. The captive girls were not killed. And I wish to point out another thing. May I? Mm -hmm. The people of Israel practiced this strange custom. And King Constantine the Great, the Roman Emperor, who lived for well over 80 years, used to practice this custom of sleeping side by side with young virgins whom he did not, however, mate with. He was one of the creators of Christianity, right? Uh-huh. Now, let me tell you, sir, there is a name for this thing. In fact, the name is also in the Bible. It is called Shulamitism. In the Song of Songs of Solomon, the male singer repeatedly refers to the woman as his Shulamit. And a Shulamit is a woman who is brought especially to rejuvenate a dying person of importance. Quote the Bible. And a woman was brought unto him 
and she lay with him, but he get no heat. Sometimes, for a parent, a mother or a father, to sacrifice his own child is an act of self-rejuvenation. I often view with very deep suspicion the story of of is of Jacob of who Isaac, whose father had been ordered by the Lord to sacrifice him. Remember? Mm -hmm. Abraham. Yeah. Was Abraham trying to rejuvenate himself? My answer is yes. Because sacrificing your own offspring releases forces within you which can actually make you young again. Now, sir, this is one of the reasons why child abuse is today so prevalent throughout the world. I have spoken many times to men who have raped their own daughters. I have spoken many times to women who have abused their own sons, and they give me the same answer. Each time I do it, I feel good. And this would explain why um, so many of this Illuminati um, are into pedophilia. I mean, people like George Bush is infamous for it. And all over the world, um, Phenomenal numbers of children go missing every month, um, uh, more than anyone ever realizes. And, and surely this in some way is massively connected into this uh, subject we're talking about. And presumably in Africa, um, the same phenomena of missing children goes on. Exactly, so yes. At our meeting last night, do you remember the white lady I pointed out to you saying that this is a, a white lady who has a great story to tell. Uh -huh. Her name is Madame Hannah Opperman. She is the mother of a Spanish-speaking girl who was hired by an African language magazine called the Ischenwood in order to trace several children who disappeared mysteriously in South Africa. I also was involved in the at, in attempts to trace these children, most of whom were white and some of whom were black. All these children had one characteristic in common. They were either budding psychics or they were leaders in sports and other subjects in their particular school. And they were not chosen say, at random. They were carefully selected by someone. One day, a white friend of mine prevailed upon me to try and trace one of the missing children. The child had been kidnapped earlier that day and the news had come on the radio. And I was able to sit in a dark place and to concentrate fiercely on the photograph of the missing child. And I saw her being driven together with two others in the boot of a car. And some time later, that car, which was driven by four men, three white and one of Hindu appearance stopped somewhere in the, in the felt and the children were brought out of the boot of the car but one of the children, the very child we were seeking, had become very, very ill because of lack of air. And this child we followed in spirit 
we found her that she was being taken along a highway that goes into Natal from the north. And then she was taken along that highway until her captors reached the coast. And there she died, and I clearly saw her body being buried in sea sand. What happened to the other two children, I do not know. But I can tell you, sir, that after that, I totally refused to get involved in this terrible thing. Why? Because I had seen in a vision the faces of the leaders of the satanic kidnapping of children. And some of these leaders were men whose names were very big in South Africa indeed. How many children go missing in Africa, say, every month? Say, so I learned from a gentleman with a very logical mind. A gentleman who later told me that he was a Freemason, or he is a Freemason, that well over 4,000 children disappear in South Africa every month. Okay. When you were talking earlier about human sacrifice and longevity, it's um, quite a thought, the number of Illuminati people who have come up in my research again and again who live remarkably long lives. People that come to mind, and not just long lives, but fit lives for most of us. Uh, one that comes to mind immediately is Henry Kissinger um, and uh, George Bush. And then, um, although she's getting frail now, the Queen Mother in England. Um, these are people that come up in my research and they live long lives. It's quite a coincidence. You know, sir, in this life, there is no such a thing as a coincidence. I know. These people, people like this, somehow rejuvenate themselves. I do not want to know exactly how. But when you see a man like Dr. Kissing, a man who seems to be a very rock of immortality, a man we have changed little since the days of the Second World War, the man who was the leader of this man, named the President Eisenhower, is dead long ago, but Kissinger is still alive, going strong. I would like to point out a very interesting thing to you, sir, that in black communities, especially nowadays, people of extreme old age who still remain active in spite of their old age become targets of witch hunters. They become victims of witchcraft killers. My stepmother is today 98 years old, and at one time a group of young religious fanatics wanted to kill her as a witch because she was so old and had never been sick. Does it frustrate you, uh, Claire, when you look across this history of Africa that we're talking about to the present day, at how at times uh, the black people of Africa have allowed themselves to be manipulated so often easily? Yes, sir. It makes my heart to bleed. But at the same time, this is one of the proofs 
of the fact that on, in this world we are not the masters of our own destiny. This is one of the proofs that in this world we are controlled by forces far greater and far more ancient than we are. Nations are caught by these creatures, whoever they are, at a time of weakness. Nations are caught at a time when they are either emerging from major wars or at a time when people are coming together to form a new nation or a new tribe or a new clan. And that is where the terrible Chita will catch them. You've had a remarkable life, uh, not least because of the uh, horrendous things that have happened to you. Um, but there was one story you told me about what happened, I think it was in Soweto, yes. which encapsulates not just how easy it is to manipulate black people, but how easy it is to manipulate all people, because this is how um, it happened. When a journalist misquoted you and people believed it, um, could you tell us that story? The story is very simple, sir, and my life is just an ordinary life. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> after the Soweto unrest of 1976, all of us who had been supervisors in various municipality installations which had been damaged during the unrest, were called before a judge in Pretoria. The name of the judge was Justice Selee. Selee wanted all of us to give him a clear report of what we had seen take place and how the installations we were the supervisors of had been destroyed during the unrest. Many people were afraid of speaking at this, at this uh, inquiry, sir, which was called the Sidi Inquiry. And we were promised that our names would remain anonymous. But when the inquiry was on, I noticed reporters at the inquiry in a place where they were not supposed to be if the inquiry was to be held in camera, why then were the reporters there? And amongst one of the reporters, amongst the reporters was a white woman, Helen Zille. Now, I spoke to the judge, answering his questions, and then I said to the, to the judge, protection for workers in Soweto is completely inadequate. Innocent workers are being beaten up and sometimes killed by the rioting youths. Can't more protection be supplied to those of our people who are willing to work? And this white woman went on to write in a, the Rand Daily Mail newspaper that I had said that the army should be called into Soweto to quell the unrest. Now, here was a white woman defying the orders of a judge. breaking the law with impunity almost, of all the people who testified in that case, some of whom said worse things than I said, only my name was betrayed. And after that, my home was attacked by 500 or more 
school children. It happened in, in September 1976. My wife was raped. My children were beaten and injured. How they managed to escape, I don't know. And I was stoned and stabbed many times. And when I was lying on the ground completely helpless, petrol was thrown over me. And that was when I knew fear, sir. Because we African people believe that if you are bent to death, not only is your body consumed by the flame, but your soul is destroyed as well. We believe that although a human being possesses an immortal soul within him or her, that soul can be destroyed by fire. How I escaped from that Holocaust, I do not know. Something must have frightened these children. They all ran away and left me lying in my blood in, at the back of my house. And not a single one of the many neighbors I had, many of whom I had helped years before and weeks and months before with loans of money and gifts of food, not one of them moved to help me at that time. Just uh, I, yes, I was mm -hmm. taken, I managed to crawl to a municipality yard and there I hid in a corrugated iron shack until nightfall. And then a man came to see me there and this man drove away a gunman who had come in there, into that yard, to finish me off. And this man took me through a hole in the fence to the house of a Sangoma, who is one of my followers. And that Sangoma, at great risk to her life, hid me under her bed until the police came to take me out of there. I was covered with wounds and a broken knife was lodged in my body. And somebody had tried to cut off these two fingers. This is where the knife went in and here it came out. After that we hid in a, in a in the back yard of a police station. And after that, my, employ my immediate superior, a white gentleman who is a horticulturist, smuggled me out of Soweto with my family and took me to Natal, and where I stayed for over a year recovering from my injuries. And all this, cried out, is from one journalist. A yes, white sir. journalist during apartheid. Yes, sir. Saying you said something you didn't say. Yes, sir. No. And what what does that say about how easy it is to manipulate people? I mean, you must have been frustrated beyond belief. Sir, let me tell you, Mr. Ike, that the enemies of humankind, the Chitawuli, or whatever it is we choose to call them, have in newspapers a devastating weapon, a weapon for which there is no answer. Using a newspaper, they can lash out at anyone, knowing that that victim cannot fight back. Credo, what's the agenda for Africa now? We've told a long story. Um, we're in the modern world, we're looking ahead. Um, what's the agenda of the Illuminati Chittahuli for Africa and the world come to that, do you think? It appears sir, from what I see happening all over Africa that the Chittahuli are depopulating or destroying those countries in Africa which 
left to themselves could become the bread baskets of this continent. The Sudan is being destroyed. Angola has been obliterated. Mozambique has been destroyed. But wait, the countries as such have not been destroyed. Only their populations have been obliterated or brought to the edge of extermination. Why? What do these creatures want? I feel that the answer said they want to alter human society by wiping out certain races of humankind and leaving others alive. I think that Africa is being depopulated deliberately in order to enable the future dictators of this world to get at Africa's minerals without bothering to, to pay anyone for those minerals. In other words, the minerals of various countries, things which appear more important to the Chitauli than human lives, are being cleared so that they can be, continents are being cleared, countries are being cleared of people, so that people, whoever will be in power afterwards, will be able to have access to Africa's huge oil, coal, uranium, gold, and diamond deposits without having to pay any African ruler for that, those minerals. In other words, we are reaching a point where the mi minerals that come out of the ground will become the property not of small nations like Africa and the many nations that are inside there, but of the huge global government which is on the cards and which is being built now. And is that why so much violence, um, both individual violence on the streets and between tribes, between groups and between countries is going on? Yes, sir. People, it seems to me that it is the, the decision of the Chitaul to accelerate the destruction of as many human lives as possible. At the same time, to leave the minerals as well as other natural resources intact for the future rulers of the world to consume. I view, sir, with great unease a phenomenon which has been gaining ground in Africa in recent years. There has been planned and actually built in several parts of Africa things which are called peace parks huge game reserves which border on certain countries. For example, the Kruger National Park in the Eastern Transvaal borders on Mozambique. And now I understand that the Kruger National Park is to be duplicated this time in Mozambique, which is very interesting indeed, sir, in that where the new duplicate park is going to be established. It is one of the areas where, especially during the Rhodesian War, some of the heaviest, deadliest fighting and massive dispersion of tribes people actually took place. And there are a lot of game parks uh, down the uh, Rwandan border and other countries like that where um, people came in to cause the problems there and the, the genocide. Yes, sir. It's very strange. Somebody, I think, I don't know who, and quite frankly, I don't want to know. Because it's no use talking about an enemy you cannot throw a weapon at. I don't know who is planning this thing, but 
these game parks are being established at a huge price, a huge cost in human lives. These game parks are being established at the expense of the nations in whose countries the parks are. Why? Not only that, while Africans allow themselves to be manipulated by these enemies of humankind, while Africans fly at each other's throats like enraged hawks, they are specially trained men and women who are being infiltrated into the warring African countries and who continue mining Africa's minerals as if there was no war taking place. And these minerals are being taken out of these countries in huge convoys of heavy vehicles. I've seen this several times. While the war in Southwest Africa, Namibia, was being fought, there was huge smuggling of minerals, such as diamonds and so on. The same is happening in Angola. The same is happening elsewhere. The, um, the name that comes up, um, of course, in terms of so many environmental parks or game parks uh, that are United Nations agencies that speak for themselves. But there's also um, uh, so-called environmental groups like the World Wide Fund for Nature. Uh, what's your feeling about the way the environmental movement um, is being operated? The World Wide Fund for Nature, of course, is headed by Prince Philip, of whom I would certainly not buy a used car or from him. And Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, his friend, two of the bloodlines. Since that fund was established. African animals are being exterminated at an even greater rate, believe me. In the Eastern Transvaal, some farmers have broken down fences between their farms and have made their game, their private uh, game parks into one huge thing. But when you go into these game parks and you get off the vehicle and you walk a short distance by foot, you notice a very disturbing thing. One, you see no recent animal tracks anywhere around you. Two, you cannot smell animals and yet if a game park is filled with animals anywhere in Africa, you can actually smell the animals. You can smell the giraffe, the buffalo. You can smell the large antelopes. Each one has its particular smell. But if you go to those places in the Eastern Transvaal, you don't smell animals, let alone see them. There is shooting of wild game in those supposedly protected places like there is no tomorrow. And furthermore, in some of these private game reserves, you see something that fills you with disquiet. You see air streets carrying not, not small aeroplanes as one would expect, not small one engine aeroplanes. But I have seen game reserves where there is an airstrip and a hangar which carries a large aircraft, a Dakota of the 1950s. What is a gamekeeper doing with a heavy aircraft like that? What do you think the agenda of the World Wide Fund for Nature is? I think say, it's an exercise in cynicism, an exercise in utter hypocrisy. And it doesn't surprise me that the leader of this fraud is a man whose eyes are like those of a reptile, a man whose lips 
look as if they were sculptured with a cutthroat razor. What is the answer, Prada? What, what do people need to do to stop this agenda becoming reality and to turn it around and create the kind of world we want to live in? Say, I do not have any ready-made answers to your question, but I will tell you this. Our first duty is to make the whole world, the whole of humanity, aware of the threat facing it. Such is the blind spot in our brains that when people threaten us publicly that they are going to exterminate us and our entire nation, we don't take them seriously. Sir. For example, this threat to Africa is visible to everyone with a little thought, but it is so monstrous so huge and so fearsome that our conditioned minds refuse to accept this. Now, in England, sir, there is a deadly-looking animal which I once saw. That animal is really a little wizard or a witch. It is a sleek animal whose body is very flexible, the English people call it a a stoat. Stoat. Yeah, mm -hmm. a stoat. Now, when that animal chases a rabbit and corners it, the rabbit stops and freezes, and it it looks at a, the stoat with totally hypnotized eyes. It is as if this animal is refusing to see the stoat, and the stoat catches it and eats it. We are reacting exactly like that. This is the way the, the Illuminati want us to react, to be hypnotized by their supposed power, to become blind to their, to their existence exactly as a cornered rabbit refuses to see a stoat, it doesn't want to see it because it cannot handle what is standing before it. We are like that. And we must stop this stoaty mentality. We must understand that there will come a time when the damage will have become so great, will have gone so far that we will not be able to reverse it. But I believe in this power set of the great African proverb that goes, Mudimu Upala Baloi. God is greater than all the wizards and sorcerers on this earth. And I know that if as many people as possible are aware of what the Chitawuli are doing, the Chitawuli will be forced to retreat. Already there are signs that they are getting desperate. Why? Because the human being is trying to bring out the God within itself. We are trying to become gods, and we are succeeding. It's only a few decades ago when there was no one on this earth who knew or cared anything about animal conservation, who knew or cared anything about the protection of the environment. But today, sir, there are thousands of such people worldwide. It is a hopeful sign, a sign that should be encouraged. Let the power of light shine in the dark corners of conspiracy. And as it shines, let humankind be saved.
Fredo Mutua. The most remarkable man it's been my privilege to meet. And when you look at Fredo Mutua, you're looking at an unbelievable example of the true power of the human spirit. His life has been a series of astonishing challenges from the moment he was born, right to today as threats on his life continue, threats to his wife's life continue, and these challenges would have broken the spirit. Just a few of them would have broken the spirit of most other people on this planet, but they've not broken him. Here he is talking to you, revealing information that has largely never been revealed before through these sources because the pressure on him must be to keep quiet, keep the secrets. But as Credo said, Africa is dying. As a place of freedom, the earth is dying. It's time for people to know. Now this man has got the guts to stand up and speak out, despite condemnation from virtually all sides. So what are we going to do? Are we going to say, oh, that's interesting. Mm, yeah, Credo Mutua is interesting, you know. Light a candle or dismiss it. Oh, he's just a witch doctor. He's got nothing to say. In other words, are we going to find some excuse now to do nothing, to sit on our backsides and think someone else will do it or there's nothing we can do? Or are we going to express the spirit that this guy is expressing? Because if we do, this whole house of cards of global control is going to fall. It's going to be brought down by the wind of change that we will create. Or if we walk away and think there's nothing we can do, we just powerless people, what can we do? Oh my God. Or dismiss what he says or whatever. Then that house of cards is going to solidify because we're holding it together still. And we're going to live in a global fascist state. Not some distant time in the future. Oh my goodness me, it's going to be terrible for the kids. Now, in our lifetimes. Are we going to go on fighting each other? Are we going to go on being divided and ruled because someone else has got a different religion to us? Oh my goodness, call the police. Someone's got a different color to us. Someone's got a different creed to us. Someone's got a different spin on life than us. Are we going to go on doing that? Because if we are, we deserve to be in a global fascist state because we are acting in our own lives as individual fascists against those around us that don't share our view. We can unite on what we, I hope, believe in. Freedom. We can celebrate the diversity of human expression, of human ability, of the human sense of reality, the way we see the same thing in so many different ways. We can celebrate the diversity of race, the diversity of all things in this glorious web of life we call creation. And if we do that, we will not agree. Fair enough, what a boring state anyway. But we will have harmony, and therefore we will have peace via respect for each other. And the Illuminati, the Chittahuli, whatever name you want to give them, can't stand harmony, because harmony is a nightmare to manipulate. Disharmony and conflict is a piece of cake. Are we going on playing the game according to the rules of the Illuminati, fighting each other, cussing each other, blaming each other? Or are we going to decide that we're going to play games with different rules, games that have unwritten laws called love, called respect, called harmony, called peace. We have got ourselves into this state, and that's the truth, and that's good news. We have got ourselves in this state by making decisions to give our minds away and insist that everyone else does the same. We can therefore make choices that will bring this manipulation to an end, almost like that, by taking our power back to think for ourselves and giving everyone else the honor to do the same. Are we going to choose love in its true sense? 
Or are we going to choose fear? The choice is ours. It always has been. And the consequences for one or the other, in terms of our future, are immensely, immensely difficult. Freda Mutwa has shown the kind of spirit necessary to bring an end to this nonsense. If the rest of humanity shows a fraction of that, we have got nothing to concern ourselves with because this world is going to change from a prison to a paradise. It's just a choice. I know which one I'm going to make. How about you? Hope you've got something out of it. Thanks for watching.